Okay, uh, hello. Uh, today we'll talk about a very interesting architect um, born in, in Argentina, but uh, who was active uh, in, in, in Italy, uh, Giuseppe Perugini. Uh, born uh, on uh, in uh, 1914 and he died in 1995 so not quite so long ago no uh, uh, 28 years ago he died uh, let's read a little bit about him so giuseppe perugini born in buenos aires march 17th and that's the reason we talk about him today because today is march 17th but not 1914 but 2023 and he died in Rome on September 19th, 1995. Was an Argentine, uh, Argentine architect who worked in Italy. I couldn't find a lot of, uh, I found, but not on Wikipedia. Strangely, the, there is no information on Wikipedia about him. Uh, this was the man, uh, the Argentinian architect Giuseppe Perugini, uh, working at uh, an interesting tower there. Uh, and uh, let's read a little bit about him, uh, but not from Wikipedia, from a different site. Giuseppe Perugini arrived in Rome in the early 30s and enrolled in the Faculty of Architecture. After graduating in 1941, he began an intense teaching and research activity at the Faculty of Architecture as a professor of ar architectural composition. A further demonstration of his desire to experiment is the fact that he was among the first scholars to propose in the 1960s the use of computers as instrument authorizing modular elements, 1960s. To this end, he presented a series of projects to international competitions, such as the circular bridge over the Strait of Messina, the Plateau Bobur Tower Helix, born from the integration of particularly expressive signs and avant garde technological choices, and others, such as the well known Cybernetic Hospital or the UNIDO, UNIDO headquarters in Vienna, where the function is privileged through the decomposition and recomposition of cells aggregated electronically according to the actual needs, thus elim eliminating the conventional dispersions of the traditional architectural object. Very interesting. So he was, uh, he was a visionary. His first work, the mo monument to the Fosse Ard Ardeatin in Rome, I'm not sure I pronounced well, but how else to be pronounced at the same time, architectural structure, symbol, and memorial appears as a unique tomb, a collective tomb, uh, mem memorializing uh, building, and we are going to see it. While the buildings of the judicial city were configured as a true citadel, inspired by the urban aspect of the justice of the classical age. Uh, also belonging to the same ideology are the Church Sacrarium of Pied Piedimonte Sari Germano, the aforementioned Bridge of Messina, the kinetic explosion of the project for an, uh, of an exhibition pole in the Fortezza da Basso in Florence, the binomial matter music of the Memorial Fermi Prism in uh, Chicago. But these projects I couldn't find. But I found this amazing house that he built, an experimental house, which was neglected for many years, but I think is one of the most provocative houses ever built. Casa Albero, uh, Giuseppe Perugini, uh, Casa Sperimentale, uh, Fre 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 Fregene, Roma, 1969. And uh, the buildings look stunning, even today, I don't know if they began the rest, uh, restoration. Uh, I know that, that there were efforts in this sense, but even as a ruin is, uh, is very provocative. And uh, here is, uh, I couldn't find a high resolution picture of this um, the section, uh, elevation, both, but uh, it is evocative still for how this building um, 
uh, was uh, was conceived by by this uh, by this architect. It's an amazing building. It really is much more interesting than Villa Savoie. Sorry, Monsieur Le Corbusier. I mean, I don't know some of these things. I am not an expert in his work, and I'm not an expert on this house, in this house. But uh, there are very intriguing elements here, and I imagine they do have a function. Some of these, uh, you know, strange, uh, you know, strange for uh, for such a function for a house. No, no, Giuseppe was good. He was very good. And uh, Argent and Ar Argentina, Argentine has has uh, quite a number of, uh, of uh, very interesting uh, architects. Even now, the uh, Sci Arc in Los Angeles is run by uh, uh, an architect from Argentina, Hernan Diaz Alonso. And there were other architects from Argentina, plenty of them. Diana Agrest and uh, I guess Mario Gandelzonas as well, Emilio Ambash. Uh, they, they had many interesting architects. Even Vignoli, who died just some days ago, he was not from Argentina, but uh, he lived and worked in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. They also have great writers and, of course, great uh, soccer players. It's a very interesting country indeed. But this house, we have to, we have to, we have to say, it, is is a, is a, is an astonishing house. I I feel it looks even better like this, um, you know, affected by the elements. Uh, I'm thinking now of what's written on the facade of the secessionist building in Vienna, de designed by uh, Maria Olbrich. To each time, it's art, and to art, it's freedom. Indeed, if it is so, if we give freedom to the artists, and I include the architects here as well, and if, if the artist is filled with the spirit of, of his or her time, then we can we can uh, we can uh, uh, witness creativity. And you know it's interesting that these graffitis, in my opinion, they 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 don't actually. I mean, from one point of view, you'll say they deter deteriorate, they destroy the building. But this could be like a museum of graffitis. You know, the building somehow. The building is generous enough to accommodate the uh, graffiti as well. I mean, look at this very ingenious step here to, you know, it, it's an event it's a, in itself. Uh, it's not the only building he built. Uh, we are going to see a few other things, including a hotel, which is uh, the one which is, uh, you know, the most recognizably, uh, you know, in good shape and uh, employed as it was meant to be employed. But this house is still, uh, you know, I would say the most provocative work he did. Look at the transition between the column and the slab with this intermediate element, red. 
very different from Carlos Carpa, and yet somehow it makes me think of Carlos Carpa with what he did in, with the, that apartment building in, in uh, Vicenza. Perugini, bravo to him. Look at the ingenious way in which he supports structurally the building. You know, you have the here the vertical uh, structure element, then the beam, the, the horizontal one, and then crossing the large one to smaller ones and then you have the transitional element here in metal rotated in red not bad it's very alive this this ruin well it's true the trees around it uh, um, you know, add to the, the feeling of uh, vivacity and, and life. It's true. And you see what he does at the top, he does at the bottom as well. I always stress the importance of these intermediate entities, you know, where column touches the slab underneath and the column touches the slab or whatever horizontal structural element. You need an inter, in, inter, in, intermediate element like he uses here in a rather, you know, spectacular way. Now we see uh, the human silhouette, so we can have a feeling about the scale of all of this. The building was vandalized, but it's still breathing life and it's still, um, it's still inspiring, I would say. It pays to be unconventional. It pays to be non-conformist. It pays to be experimental, to do experiments, to express your, your creativity as much as possible. It does pay. That's why I keep telling everybody, don't be timid. Express yourself. Have courage. Drink something if you need to, you know, to you have some difficulties to start. Drink something. Get drunk with architecture. And here you see the plans. And the you know the structural diagram and the section or what is it an elevation of the building. It's a mechanism, but somehow it's a romantic mechanism. It's playful. It's a house for homo ludens. Giuseppe Perugini, bravo to him. And this is a drawing done, uh, you know, recently because there are some attempts and we are going to read about it to, to restore it. I hope they, but I don't know, who knows? Through restoration, you could also destroy sometimes if you are not careful. Uh, it's a very unique house. The rebirth of Casa Albero, as I said, there, are, there were attempts when I made this presentation, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, I read this. And let's uh, read a little bit about it. Rome, 2020, so three years ago, 25 years have passed since the death of architect Perugini, Giuseppe Perugini and his Casa 
experimentale is still being talked about. Of course it is, and it and and it deserves it. It has deservedly returned to the public spotlight thanks to an exhibition at the Weissenhof Gallery in Stuttgart 5 and the establishment in Rome of a committee tasked with its protection. The Comitato Permanente, no, here is in Italian, I don't know Italian, so uh, let's, uh, no, no, uh, it's just a little bit of Italian. The Committee for the Protection of the Tree House, this is how it's called, has already cleaned the pala and other sections in the main structure of the graffiti that has built up over the years of neglect. The, the new organization's inten, intention, espoused by the current owner, architect Rinaldo Perugini, probably, uh, uh, you know, a relative uh, of some sort, maybe even his son, I don't know, is that Casa Alber, Albero should become a public space a cultural center that can host initiatives and events aimed at enhancing its educational and cultural potential. This signals a return to its origins for Perugini's work with its intrinsically experimental and open nature in a reversal of the degradation and neglect that we are unfortunately used to, to seeing in Italy. The author of this text is obviously Italian, our small initiative, undertaken with open hearts and lights, is intended to help spread the word about an important but little known architectural work and about the passion that derives, that drives the volunteers of the committee for its rediscovery and uh, reassessment. And here is uh, uh, an image of, uh, you know, uh, rendering, uh, uh, done, uh, you know, recently, you know, 2020 or, or so uh, with a building. Uh, but somehow, I mean, sorry for being, uh, you know, maybe excessive in, in my non-conformity. Somehow I like the building more, um, you know, with all those graffitis and all those, um, you know, uh, signs of being affected by the elements than here. But I hope it's just because of the the cold rendering. It, it, they were studying actually mainly in, through this rendering the the artificial lighting of the building. Anyway, and now we are going to see another work by Perugini, Hotel Delta in Rome, which is uh, uh, you know like brand new uh, or almost. Is this building here? And it's very different from the Casa Sperimentale. Uh, it has, uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's perfectly symmetrical. Uh, I mean, the functions on the top are a little bit different, but otherwise it's a symmetrical building. And uh, it only shows how uh, versatile was uh, Giuseppe Perugini. And this is how it looks like, the hotel by Giuseppe Perugini. Usually a hotel has small windows, no? Uh, but here we see huge windows, this with a particular uh, geometry and we are going to see details. And then uh, these uh, bands, this um, horizontal window, they become almost graphic horizontal lines on the facades of the tower, of not tower, of the building. Now you see better the, uh, you know, um, the rather surprising uh, windows, the vertical ones. And even here, Perugini showed his creativity. Because uh, in a building that is actually not very tall, I mean, you see the other buildings on the, on the, on the street, I don't know, six, seven floors or so. But this, because he changed uh, dramatically the size of the openings, you are confused. I mean, this building could could have been, uh, you know, uh, larger, uh, but taller, and it, it has a monumentality that that at first, when you look at it, you don't say this this is a hotel, but it is a hotel. This is an interesting work too.
very different from uh, uh, the experimental house. But still, uh, I wouldn't say that this is uh, a building that uh, should leave one indifferent. And we see indeed Rome. We see the trees and the, you know, uh, almost typical Roman building and the light. The light in Rome is, is, is magnificent. Here is this uh, unexpected window. Seen from below. Now we see the work that uh, we read about, uh, one of his earliest works, and it was built, Mausoleo delle Fosse Ardeatine, Roma, Italy. He worked with Nello Aprile, Cino Calpatrina, Cal Cal Calcaprina, Aldo Cardelli, Mario Fiorentino. Uh, and very interesting work, this one as well. Here it is. It's a mausoleum, uh, you know, uh, uh, collective uh, uh, tomb, but it's done very well. Uh, I don't think I have great pictures, but um, maybe this was, I'm not sure if it was, no, no, it, it, well, this is how it looks like uh, today. And this uh, heavy slab, if we are to call it so, is floating above the land, uh, uh, but but here is open actually. So uh, we, we are going to see in detail the images from the inside. You know, it's it's actually a remarkable work, this heavy slab or slab-like horizontal uh, um, part of the building that uh, is, is very heavy, you know, it creates a feeling of, uh, oppression and it's about death let's not forget this this is about death these people died i don't know the particulars about uh, what what the uh, memorializing uh, uh, you know uh, function of the building is but it's 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 uh, it's, it's it's a building that uh, is is a memorial so uh, I think uh, symbolically and metaphorically is very powerful, this very heavy horizontal surface that creates indeed uh, uh, compression. I would say it's brilliant, it's very powerful. Maybe Vladimir Putin should see too, you know, and uh, think about all those people who die uselessly and uh, and, and tragically uh, uh, in, in 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 the in the in the in, un, in, in the unacceptable war in in Ukraine now. I I just I just cannot understand. I cannot comprehend how we wage. Such wars for what? It's one of the best memorials that I know of. Uh, when I look at this wall here of stone, and I think of the that museum that uh, David Chipperfield built in Berlin. I was thinking about it, what irritated me so much about that massive giant wall towards the river is not just the dimension, it's, it's not just the dimensions of the wall uh, agitate me, uh, but also the material. If you would have used the material that was, uh, it's stone, yes, but it's, it's domesticated stone. Unlike here, here is not domesticated stone. This is stone that is raw, that is rough, and thus belongs to the earth, belongs to nature. If David Chipperfield would not have been so obsessed by his, uh, uh, you know, beloved uh, whiteness or almost whiteness, and he would have created a base that was a transition between the majestic white, uh, you know, uh, thing uh, building on top of his Acropolis in Berlin and the water, 
would have been more acceptable, but, but he didn't. But here we see Perugini understanding, you know, be, in a way, it's, it's, I mean, you have the, 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 the earth, well, it is uh, cemented, is, uh, you know, uh, not, maybe, maybe it would have been better without, but maybe not. But we see the slab, the horizontal, powerful, heavy, very heavy slab above, and then the transition towards this horizontality here, this horizontal surface, through these intermediate walls that are left rough, rough stone. It's, it's, it's important. It's very important. He chose correctly, I would say, Perugini and, and, and his uh, colleagues in the team because he didn't design it alone. It's a good work. I'm not so sure about this curve here, but I, I, I think this kind of memorial doesn't easily accept uh, curves which are sensuous uh, in, in general. And uh, but. Who knows? Is to collect water or something? Because you know, I I, I don't know. But otherwise, it's, it's it's a very moving work. It's a meditation on the finality of life. It is a meditation on death architectural meditation. And here is the plan. It's very simple. You have that, I call it slab, very heavy, a rectangle, and then underneath, the individual tombs. That's it. And then you have the zigzagging uh, pathway that leads to the memorial. I don't know what happened. Maybe unless this goes underground, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they gave up on, 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 on the other pathway. I don't know. But this is how apparently the, the building, the memorial looks like, you know, on the site plan. and the parking here, of course, because this is uh, far away from the city. Here it is, it's in the country. I don't know what are these things on the top because I don't think, or the rust skylights. Um, I don't see skylights now. Interesting, this picture, at first, um, there is confusion, you know, the first reaction. But I think it's, a, it's an accurate, uh, you know, picture from 
underneath the slab and taking a picture towards the outside and maybe not with the, the best camera, but uh, the first feeling you have is that something surreal happens here. But no, it's, uh, it's the actuality of the building. During construction, And the sketch, I like the sketch as well. Very expressionistic, you know, it's very artistic. A nervous drawing. And I think architects should indulge sometimes in nervousness, expressing their own turmoil through their drawings. So this was done actually immediately after the war, 1947. So this was the vision of the architect for, for the project that we just saw, which was built. Excellent drawing. Architecture does have the power to move one's heart, does have the, the, the power to, to, to create uh, reactions, em emotional reactions, and it's obvious with this building. Giuseppe Perugini. And this is the, <clears throat> the tombstone of uh, Perugini. And I think I tried to zoom in and to read. Apparently, it's possible his wife also is buried here. But the, the gravestone of the Perugini family, I think, it's him there. But there is another person also with the name Perugini, probably his wife, itself is, uh, is rather you know, unsettling and provocative. How is that thing standing there, you know, in its corner like that? It's, it's uh, again, it shows the, the unconventional uh, mind or, you know, uh, state of mind of the architect, because I imagine he designed it. Uh, <clears throat> it was, was done in 1995. I mean, he died in 1995. I mean, compare this uh, gravestone with all the others around. That's it. So let's wish him happy, happy birthday. And personally, I'm happy that I discovered this architect I knew nothing about a few years ago. Thank you.